let's go ahead and introduce um there is another fabulous uh fred johnson out there who's now going by the name of freddie lee johnson and he is a jazz musician and he's also a member of a project that is actually at the marsh now a formerly incarcerated people's project and he's one of the storytellers for that and he's also um a jazz musician and um he's also in his life he's been involved once he was paroled um he became really involved in the harm reduction coalition a national organization that promotes the health and dignity of individuals and communities impacted by drug use. So um, there's more about Fred on our website, but just wanted to give you a little window into what you're about to see. So let's give a warm welcome to Freddie Lee Johnson performing uh, Success in Minor. <laughs> this song over 40 years ago when I was in prison, San Quentin. It's called Success in Minor. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight is success. What is success? Now, this is really a story about music and how it has impacted my life. Because music is the catalyst to most of my success. Now, it's 1965. I'm 15 years old. I'm hitchhiking around the country. I'm a journey to nowhere, I just want to be free. I end up in Denver, Colorado, cold, new to the city, homeless, even though we didn't call it that at that time, uh, being free would be more appropriate. So I'm just tripping around the city. It was snowing and the snow is dirty and the cars are throwing dirty slush on me, and, but I'm happy. A little cold, and I pass a pawn shop window and I see a trumpet. It's not new, it's not shiny, and I never thought about playing the trumpet before or any other instrument for that matter, but I want that trumpet. They want a hundred bucks for it. I can't take my eye off of it. Hundred dollars. I have eighty dollars that I had panhandled up. I'm gonna go in because I'm not gonna leave the store without that trumpet. Go in the pawn shop and it's musty, dark, and it looks like a lot of junk to me except for the trumpet. And I'm met by this big, tall, fat guy with a big head and he's barking at me. Hey kid, what can I do for you? How can I help? Sir, I'd like to buy that trumpet in the window for $100, but I have 80. Can we work that out? He barks again. No. I said, okay, Fred, you got to be cool now because it's going to take some work. You're not going to leave without this trumpet. And I began to beg. Sir, you don't understand. I have to get this trumpet and... Can I shovel some snow for you? Can I work it off? And he's listening. And I start pulling out my little crumply dollar bills and putting it on the counter that I panhandle up. No, I have them in different pockets because that's for the stick up kids. If you get stuck up, at least they won't get everything. I'm pulling it out of my socks and I have a big bag of change in my backpack. I place everything on the counter. To my surprise, he says, come on, kid. We go to the window, he pulls the trumpet out and puts it under one arm, the case under another, and he proceeds to escort me out of his establishment, back into the snow and the dirty snow and the slush. 
but I'm happy. Successful, I, I did this myself. I'm so happy. Put the horn in the case and I started walking. I realized something. I'm carrying this horn in my right arm, my short arm. So what does that mean? You see, I was told that I was defective, that I had a birth defect. Recently, my sister cousins, they told me no, Cassandra and Lynn, they told me no, this was a medical mistake. They used forceps. Well, this is all that I know, so it, it wasn't bothering me. I got a cool name out of it. Yeah, they call me Short Jab. Has a ring to it. Short Jab, what's going on, baby? Yeah, I like that. That's what they used to call me. It's a cool name. Now, it dawns on me that I've become an instant horn carrier. Now I had to learn how to play the horn. Shouldn't be that hard. It only has three little vowels. Little buttons there. I need a song. This is my secret song that I used to sing to myself. I didn't sing it in my neighborhood because the guys would have thought it was a little corny and loud. But I love this song. Who's walking down the streets of the city, smiling at everybody he meets? I changed it a little. Who's walking down the streets of the city? Everyone calls him Freddy. I want to learn to play that song. So I take the horn out the case. In the middle of the sidewalk, people are bumping into me, cursing me out, get out the way. And I play my first note. This is the first note that I've ever played. I want to share it with you. Still the best note that I've ever played to this day. It's beautiful. I know, I know you agree. Can you hear it? I did all of that myself. I had to be honest. No one did it for me, and I didn't steal the horn, I bought it. I put my whole life into this little hole right there. Oh, I felt good. And I practiced, I practiced for the next three or four weeks, wherever I could, just practice and tripped around the city, just walking around, so happy, so much success. I'm walking. One day, and I see this big, colorful sign on the side of the building. It says Model Cities Cultural Center. And pictures, I later learned it was called a, uh, also a, a mural. But you have musicians, drummers, horn players, saxophone players. Oh, it was wonderful. It just caught my eye. And beneath it, you had people, real life people, hanging out. And they just looked real cool to me smoking cigarettes and talking to each other, the way they were dressed. I went over and introduced myself. Excuse me, brother. What is this place, the model, model cities? Young blood, this is the cultural center. See, we teach the arts. Oh, you teach people how to write, I mean, how to write and paint, things like that. We do that, young blood, but we also teach people the arts, music, theater, yeah, acting, writing. And it's free if you live in the ghetto. I'm saying to myself, well, that leaves me out. I used to live in the ghetto, but I hitchhike around the country now. I sleep mostly on the side of the highway. See, I have my sleeping bag in my backpack. Anyway, he says, well, look, young blood, what is that you're carrying in the case? Like he didn't know. I found out later that there were some of Denver's elite jazz musicians. 
I came to life. I said, it's a trumpet. You see, I'm a musician. You're in the right place. Will you play something for us? Oh, I was so happy. Because, let me tell you why. Those three weeks, four weeks that I was practicing on the streets, I got cursed out so much. People were telling me, hey, you little MF, get away from my window with that noise. I go to the park. The ladies would, hey, get my kid, my kid, you're disturbing my kids. I was so happy, though, it didn't bother me. I said, okay, yes, yes, I'm gone, bye. Now they're asking me to play for them. Oh, I'm going to show them how much I know. He says, by the way, how long have you been playing? I said, oh, about three weeks. They could hardly contain their laughter. I knew I was amusing them, and I liked them. They liked me. So I take the horn. If you looked at my body gestures, you would think I was the second coming of Miles Davis. And the show began. My interpretation of Wendy. Now, I thought it was pretty good. However, I heard this clapping. I only played, couldn't have been more than a minute. And I just heard it and it wouldn't stop. I figured it out. They wanted me to stop. They had enough. So I'm standing there. Feels it's an accomplishment to me. I have my little chest out. I'm standing there smiling, proud, success. But nobody's saying nothing. They're not saying nothing. They're just looking at me. And I start shrinking, you know, like, but I'm fighting. I know I did something positive, something good. I didn't know what to do. And this lady emerges from the crowd. And she's walking towards me. Pretty lady, tall, with leotards on, and she walked on her tippy toes. Seems like when she, every step she took, she was just floating. She introduced herself to me as Miss Cleo. Hello, Freddie. My name is Miss Cleo. I am the director of the dance department. She bent over, she's very tall, put her arm around me and said, baby, that was so good. You really must have practiced a lot to play like that. You keep it up, you hear? Thank you. Yes, Miss Cleo. You see, she rescued me. There's an attraction there. I figured it out. She had that mother vibe, that mother thing going on. I miss my mom. Yeah. I left New York when I was 10, 10 and a half. But there was a lot of love in my house. A lot of love. There's a lot of violence as well. My mother and father, they fight all the time. I mean, they would fight, fight almost every day. There was blood all over, knives. I remember my brother Keith and myself, we stood there one time and watching helpless as my mother and father falling out the window. And they were grappling, just holding on to the windowsill, anything, the curtains, blinds, everything, trying not to fall. And we couldn't do anything. They didn't fall. But we found ways to cope. We found ways to cope. We had a roach problem. Just couldn't get rid of the roaches. We bombed the whole building. They'd still come back. Keith and myself, we became roach warriors. This gave us a sense of purpose. 
we would get our soldiers, we merged forces. We used to fight each other with our little toy soldiers. We would get them ready by using the blood from my parents and putting it on the soldiers, our toy soldiers. Made it more realistic. We get ready for battle. Really gave us a sense of purpose. We have one rule. We could only kill the roaches with our soldiers. We could not stop them, which we did. We'd wait middle of the night, we'd turn the kitchen light on, roaches would be all over, everywhere. And then they have the flying roaches. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen flying roaches before. And we'd attack, killing roaches, and we'd cheat. We kill them with our feet. We stomp on them. We felt real good because we were helping out. And we had a place to bury them too. The roach graveyard, my mother's plants. So we had ways of coping. And you know, from time to time, you know, I had a heroin habit was only $2 a bag at the time, $1.50 if you was a regular. We used to call it doogee in New York. You know, and I just, when I left, I left New York, uh, left the apartment. I heard my mother one time tell my, my father, she said, one of their episodes. So all that was great for a while. We, we coped. One day I heard my mother tell my father, oh, you cripple mother effing bastard. Whoa. My world just stopped, everything. It was just silence. I, I didn't know what to feel or what to say. I looked at my arm. I looked at my father, he had polio, and he walked with a cane. He was massive from top, but he walked with a cane. And I looked at my mother. Then I could think after a while. I said, well, what does she think of me? I know I had to go. This being a kid, didn't work anymore. I wanted to be a man. I wanted to grow up and get my own. I wanted to be like the boxers, the basketball players. I left. I left. So I survived the best way that I could. Stole things that I needed. Slept in rooftops, basements. And out of, a friend of mine used to let me in his apartment, sneak me in there from time to time. And I sleep under the clothes in the closet so their parents couldn't see me. Like I said, I had a heroin habit as well. And um, what's that love, that mother love I missed though? So let me tell you what happened. So Miss Cleo grabs me closer. She looks up at the crowd. She says, he was wonderful, wasn't he? Nobody laughed. I just felt so good being close to her, being next to her. She was taking care of me. It's been so long. She looked at me and she said, baby, you're where you belong. We got you. Don't you worry. Thank you, Miss Cleo. Thank you, everyone.